Hi, David Vizard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. Just as a reminder, this is the No BS channel, and we really try to bring you stuff that's cutting edge. Now, we've already done that with episode 85 and I think 103 by giving you cam data that you couldn't have got from a pro stock team, right? Contrary to what a lot of people may say. Well, here's something else that a lot of you have been waiting for. Polyquad. This gives you results better than any other conventional modifications for a four valve head on the face of the planet. So I don't want any of this, well, Vizard stuff is always a little bit out of date. It's hardly current or in advance of most stuff. Well, this is a change here. This polyquad deal has been used very infrequently, but it has been used on Formula One cars and Indy cars when the class allowed. Also, in 2004, yes, that's how old it is, I, I designed this 25 years ago and spent ages trying to get the patent. Finally, to got a partner who paid for the patents. I don't know. They were, back in 2000, they were like 20 grand. Maybe a bit more than that. So, although I have controlling interest in the patent, I did not pay for the patent bill because at that time I'd spent all the money on research for this. Now, let me say that we're going to use this polyquad first on a Mustang and second on a Mazda 4 of our head. I'm going to do the Mustang first because that's my car and I'm working on it. I've got to start on the cylinder head due to some other project that needed the head done first. So what is polyquad? Well, poly means number, quad is four. A polyquad head has four different sized valves. Here's an example showing the difference between a polyquad and a conventional uh, style cylinder head. If you look at the polyquad ones, you will see that the big intake is opposite the small exhaust and the small intake is opposite the big exhaust. Now, this is critical because we need to have a flow difference between the intake, not so much the exhaust, but definitely on the intake. Now, this isn't a gimmick. Let me tell you the reason why it's got four different size valves. Four valve heads traditionally don't pull well at low RPM. Uh, that's one of the reasons why all these variable cam timing deals come in. Now, in actual fact, I think that, um, and I can prove this, that the average person buying a car is paying over the odds for a four valve engine. Two valve engines were not plumbed to the extent they should. Now I'm gonna do a video on that. Why do we have four valve, four cylinder engines? Because it's not the best way to go about it. Right, but back to our polyquad. Four valve engines don't pull low down. Why? Because basically they don't have any swirl. Now, they do have tumble. That's where the air comes in the two valves and tumbles like this. If that tumble is sufficient, it will place replace swirl, which is like this. And you can get a combination of tumble and swirl, and it's usually called twirl. Now, I don't know if, if I was the one responsible for naming this, or somebody in my shop did. It might have been my student, Mike Parry, 40 years ago, uh, named it that. Could be. But I never found the word twirl in any book or uh, papers, SAE papers, before I heard it from, from Mike. Anyway, on with the story. 
Here's what happens if the cylinder head generates tumble. What happens is, is the higher the compression goes, the more it quenches the tumble. So by the time you get to about 10.5, mixture can be not exactly stagnant, but certainly nothing like as good as swirl. Now, on a lot of setups where the chamber is smaller than the bore, what happens with swirl is as it's compressed, it goes into a smaller circle, a smaller area, and the retention of angular momentum comes in and the swirl actually gets faster. Now, what is swirl worth? Well, in my cylinder head book, I show a graph that shows what swirl is like on a small block Chevy engine. The head having no swirl and the head having swirl. Now, both the same uh, deal here. And this was done without removing the cylinder head. So if you want to know how I did that, that nice tricky deal. Small block Chevy is one of the few engines you can do this. I did not make any changes to the cylinder head casting itself. The cylinders went from almost no swirl to swirl. Yeah, get the book, you'll find out how. Now, you'll see that when there was swirl on that Chevy, the torque was up probably around 15%, right at low RPM, like 1500. Now, what Polyquad does is by having the valves at different sizes and different depths in the chamber, it induces swirl and it can induce more swirl than you'd ever need. As a result, it pumps up the low speed torque as good as, if not better, than most variable valve timing setups. Now that's a complicated deal. I wouldn't design an engine with variable valve timing. Why? Because I know how to get that low speed torque and the top end at the same time. If you want evidence of this, there's an article that came out, I don't know, in Motor Magazine years ago, and it showed that my two-valve motor made more torque and horsepower than a Cosworth BDA engine, it's 100cc bigger did, throughout the RPM range. More horsepower and more torque. And it pulled from under 600 RPM in high gear. And I don't mean it just trundled off, it pulled hard. The result was that the test drive was so um, uh, leaning in the favor of my engine versus the Cosworth one that they didn't print all the Cosworth stuff. And I called up and said, well, why not? And they said, you've already embarrassed them enough with a two valve engine, 100 cc smaller already. Now that engine also passed smog this, on this factory uh, deal. It had to pass all smog um, tests as per the uh, factory does to uh, certify a car. Now then, you might say, what's the different size valves going to do? Well, to get polyquad to work, what you have to do is you have to have one bigger intake and one bigger exhaust so that two you have two valves diagonally one intake and one exhaust that are bigger than their neighbors now you'll notice that we've got a big intake valve facing a small exhaust we have a smaller intake valve facing a big exhaust now what this does is it also cuts the cross flow from overlap also, sinking the exhaust valves in the head also cuts the cross flow from the intake charge coming in. Now, that's good because it traps a, a less diluted charge. And reversing at low RPM with a four valve engine is chronic, right? Not only do they flow good forward, they flow like a toilet backwards as well. That's not what you want. So, on top of that, we get the swirl. Now, usually what I do is do the uh, uh, ports with the bias and all that to, to match to what it, what's going on. But here's the problem, especially for guys who are 
looking to get some power and they don't want to spend a fortune but they got a, gr a grinder or you want to take it to somebody and have it done the porting itself is not difficult now what we've got to do here is get more flow from one intake valve and go with the one with less off the seat flow this is important because if we have big flow here small flow here especially as the valves are closing we get a really good swirl in this direction now we also get some tumble we doesn't get rid of the tumble so we end up with twirl but it's predominantly swirl and here's the thing it's off to one side so it's off to this side this is a big valve it's off towards that this is good because nearly every four valve head has got the spark plug right in the middle of the chamber so if it's got swirl motion if we had a very clean setup motion at the spark plug is still zero and that's where you need this mixture motion so when it's off to one side the uh, the spark plug sees swirl all right swirl uh, swirl over here like this what happens burns fast does burn more complete yes our emissions testing showed that we did this on a four for a four valve ford uh motor the uh one like they've got in the focus and it showed that the uh raw exhaust untreated was significantly better on emissions right so now i've got you through all that i'll show you a few diagrams they'll pop up first let's look at the primary means of generating swirl this is pretty obvious if you look at this diagram here you will see that much more air flows through the big valve so the tendency is the larger mass of air will rotate the in-cylinder charge in the direction dictated by that valve. It will overcome the uh, tendency to rotate airflow from the smaller valve. But it doesn't stop there. The ports themselves are shaped to favor the direction of rotation of the bulk charge in the cylinder. Take a look at this port here. For the big valve and you'll see that the flow is naturally biased towards the long side if we go over and look at a valve and port for the short side we see that as far as possible the flow is made to favor coming out the short side this further uh, tips the favor of mass flow in the rotation of the charge. In this case, the rotation is anti-clockwise. So if I posed the question, how well did this method of generating swirl work? I would be not exactly truthful for saying that it worked well. I still wouldn't be exactly truthful if I said it worked very well. Something nearer the mark would be almost unbelievably well. The bottom line is, it turned out that even on our first try, the amount of swirl developed was off the chart. The swirl meter I was using was the uh, one that Performance Trends sell, the paddle wheel one. And it was all set up for the bore size and everything for that Mitsubishi 2 liter engine that we're showing that I'm going to show the chart on. Now, how much swirl to give it? That was the question. Not knowing, because this had never been done before to my uh, knowledge, we gave it about the same degree of swirl that we'd get in a good high torque cylinder head on a small block Chevy. Now that was our standard. So here's a graph to show you the before and after swirl. 
the green lines indicated by that bouncing arrow pointing towards the swirl box are the swirl. The dotted line is the before and the solid line is after. Notice that even after we backed out about half of what we had, we are still way up on the minuscule amount of swirl that was present in a conventional cylinder head. Since we have the graph in front of us here, I might as well comment on the flow. As you can see, the intake and exhaust flowed much better after. Now, I do want to raise a point here. This was due only to the increase in flow efficiency of the valves. There was virtually no enlargement of the port itself on either the intake or exhaust as they were already at the maximum size they could be for the valve sizes we had. Now I don't know why but most four valve heads have too big of an intake port. Smaller ports are what is needed with almost all these four valve heads. So much for generating swirl. Now let's consider the financial aspects of this. What I've showed you so far is what could be best described as a pure unadulterated polytech, polytech, polyquad cylinder head. Now, when we did this cylinder head, it involved getting 16 specially made valves uh, from Ferrer. And I get a pretty good deal from Freya. They let me have everything at their, at their maximum uh, discount. What we're going to address here in the first head that I'm doing for the, uh, the Mustang and the, um, uh, the other Mazda is I'm doing a pseudo polyquad because you can do it with the stock size valves. Am I going to tell you how it's done? No, that's for the next edition, right? I'm going to show you how it came about how this was done on the uh, Mustang head first and then and of course it'll be applicable to virtually any um, uh, cylinder head so that'll be good now it's not quite as effective but it's close so essentially for maybe half the cost you'll get 90% of the results let me say right here and there Doing a fully polyquaded head, even on just a four-cylinder engine, is not cheap. I would say in today's costs, you could expect to pay in the region of $5,000 for a fully polyquaded head. And that's on the cheap side. If you're going to go to one of the big names in the business, it could be as much as $7,000. Spending that much money, what's it worth in terms of horsepower? Well, you've got to look at this two ways. One is that over a non polyquaded head, depending on the boost, it will give between 50 and 100 horsepower and between 50 and 100 foot pounds on, say, a two liter engine. Now, if you are going to put that boost up, you may reach the limit of power with a conventional head a lot sooner. So the polyquad head pays off even more. Uh, we did some dyno testing with the, uh, the client that we had for our original Mitsubishi polyquad head. And this showed 110 foot-pounds more torque and 100 horsepower more. The before test used 50 pounds of boost. The after test did that on about 46 pounds of boost. So it was about four pounds of boost less for 110 foot pounds more and 100 horsepower more. How did this car do on the track? I think I've mentioned this before. It just wasted the opposition. I mean, it wasn't even a race, right? I mean, they just walked away from some of the country's top racers. Now, are we done with our polyquad head? Are we seeing this uh, extra low speed torque 
solely due to swirl. No. One of the problems with any valves that are canted towards each other like this, like anything that has a hemi configuration, is that during the overlap period, you can have a charge go from the intake straight out the exhaust. That's not what we want. Hey, it might show good on the volumetric efficiency, air consumption, but the trapping efficiency is terrible. How can we do that? Well, in a way, the first step, in a way, is that with a polyquad head, you have a big valve facing a small one, and a small valve facing a big one. So, the valve, the way the air comes in, it has less, a slightly less chance of going out of the exhaust because the, they're uh, further apart and uh, they're, uh, they're just not precisely aligned, but that's only a small effect. How we get the other effect, or rather how we build on that effect, is we sink the exhaust valve so that the chamber shape is intake, dip, exhaust so that you have a situation like this. So during the overlap period, the intake charge tends to go over the top of the exhaust valve rather than straight out the exhaust port. Now you would think that that wouldn't make much difference, but we've done this on quite a few different styles of cylinder heads. And believe it or not, as little as an eighth of an inch can transform what happens in that period there. Now, way back when, I was working with one of my friends in England who was a, an incredibly good engineer. Uh, and he had done, on the, on the race engine that he was in charge of, on a mini head, he had made the intake valve stand up in the chamber by about 300,000. So here's the exhaust down here, here's the intake up here. Now, he had a big cam in the motor. With the valves level, that engine came on the cam with a bang at about 4,000 RPM. With the valves up like this, it pulled hard from 2,800. Now I don't mean it just went, it pulled hard from 2800. Why? Because the intake charge almost could not make it into the exhaust port because during the overlap the exhaust valve wasn't even 300 thousandths off the seat it was more like 100. So the intake charge had a distinct volume of the chamber that it utilized without getting mixed up with the exhaust as easy. Now we aren't going to use such a big cam for a turbo motor. But nonetheless, even on street cams, that bit of, uh, how should I say, tracking from the intake to the exhaust still occurs. By dropping the chamber by about a tenth of an inch makes a huge difference. That plus the swirl is where this big increase in low speed torque occurs. I'm gonna talk about that uh, more in depth in the next uh, edition of this. At this point in time I think I've covered all the basics of polyquad. So my thought here is we'll get down to the detail and how we can make our four valve heads better for normally aspirated, better for turbo and better for nitrous. There's no downside. It is just better. That will be in the next episode which I hope is coming up soon. Why? Because it's do, I'm doing it on my Mustang head. Now I want to get out and do some track days this summer in it. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. All of you out there are watching this, you will want to know when I launch the uh, 100 mile per gallon car rental story. And I'll tell you now, it's only going to those people who've subscribed. So, just for a click like this, you're going to see what I hope is history confirmed. Did it exist? Did it not? We will confirm this one way or the other, for sure. The evidence is undeniable. I'll see you the next time. Thank you for watching.